Hey everybody, welcome back to the final Unfinished Tales class. This is class number 13 of 13, our last uh, Europe-friendly bonus class here uh, on our final week. And uh, I've uh, stuck to schedule actually a little bit better than I thought I might. Uh, we still have the Palantiri to talk about tonight, but... Or tonight, I'm used to saying tonight, it's actually today over here. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm glad you guys could join me. Um, Let's jump straight into it here uh, to make sure get through all the stuff that I wanted to get through here tonight. And, and I do have two last things that I wanted to touch on um, in conjunction with the Istari, which I had to skip over at the end of class last night. Um, and the first is the quite remarkable passage from uh, Tolkien's later notes about the possible identification between Gandalf and Manwe. Who was Gandalf? It is said that in later days, when again a shadow of evil arose in the kingdom, it was believed by many of the faithful that the, of that time that Gandalf was the last appearance of Manwe himself before his final withdrawal to the watchtower of Taniqueto. That Gandalf, sorry, that Gandalf said his name in the West had been a Loren was, according to this belief, the adoption of, of an incognito, a mere byname. I do not, of course, know the truth of the matter. This is, by the way, Tolkien speaking. I do not know, of course, know the truth of the matter. And if I did, it would be a mistake to be more explicit than Gandalf was. But I think it was not so. Manwe will not descend from the mountain until the Dagor Dagoroth, and the coming of the end when Melkor returns. To the overthrow of Morgoth he sent his herald Aonwe. To the defeat of Sauron would he not then send some lesser but mighty spirit of the angelic people, one coeval and coequal, doubtless, with Sauron in their beginnings, but not more? Oloran was his name, but of Oloran we shall never know more than he revealed in Gandalf. Um... Uh, yes, Ed, you're right. This is very Odin-like, and uh, and there's at least one other person uh, by email was sort of pointing. I think Yana, I think it was perhaps you, uh, was talking about the uh, sort of similarity between Gandalf and Odin. Yeah, um, uh, it, it, certainly true. I mean, many of the the um, the ways in which Odin is depicted in the Norse tradition, you know, as this you know man gray cloaked uh, sort of going about uh, showing up where you least expect him and. Um, uh, it, it is rather like Odin's, and I don't know. I mean, you know, we 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 don't know from this passage if that connection, you know, if if like, you know the the myths of Odin um, were one of the things that uh, kind of Tolkien had in mind that sort of prompted this uh, this comparison or prompted him to address this question. Um, no idea, but uh, but there certainly is that similarity there. I don't know myself quite what else to do with it, um, as. Obviously, to go, you know, to sort of bowl, uh, you know, bowl forward and say something very crude like Gandalf is Odin would be silly. Um, but I mean, there certainly is a similarity. What I think would then be interesting would be then to look in more detail and more carefully at the at Odin and what he does and the role that he plays in his stories and compare that with Gandalf. They're not identical. Um, the roles that they play are certainly not identical. But there are some interesting similarities. So that that. I think is a comparison that would be very that would be fascinating to do. That sounds like a really good paper topic, actually. Um, but um, I, I, I agree with uh, Neil's comment here. He says it's just weird how many times Tolkien doesn't know the truth about the world he created. And the thing is, is I don't think this is just posturing. That is, I don't get the impression that Tolkien is merely like being cryptic here. That he's. Uh, um, I, Tolkien never gives me the sense, anyway, maybe I'm wrong, but he never gives me the sense that he's just toying with me when he's like, oh, I don't know. It's just a mystery, isn't it? Um, I feel like he's being obnoxious. He sounds quite honest, quite sincere. I have no idea. I, 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 and, and he is so consistent um, in thinking about the frames of his narrative and things, and so um, consistent in his adoption of the sort of the frame of himself as, you know, sort of editor, translator, um, and, you know, as for himself as merely a transmitter and one of the later transmitters of these stories, rather than the source of these stories. That, um, uh, that it, it, it's just, it's, it's just sort of part of the picture that he adopts. But the thing is, he does this not even just within the narratives where, like, you know, his voice could be, uh, in some way connected, sort of disjoined from himself, but even in his letters, you know, w when people ask him questions about things like the Antwives or Tom Bombadil or something like that, and he'll say, I don't know, 
I really, uh, you know, and, and and it just make it sound like it's it's sort of a mystery to him, and and uh, you know he'd like to know too, but he doesn't know. Um, but uh, anyway, so, um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's um, a pretty uh, a, a pretty. Uh, as I say, a pretty persistent move on his part. Um, the whole idea that he would raise this, again, this is why I sort of came back to, you know, Ed thinking about your comment about Odin and Yanni yours as well. Um, that's why I mentioned that before, because um, to some extent, this note seems a little bit unprovoked. Um, I mean, I don't know about you. I don't know what your reactions are. I don't know what struck you most in your reading through Unfinished Tales this time. But I know that when I first read Unfinished Tales, that this was one of the most eye-opening passages in the entire book. I was like, whoa! <laughs> I mean, it never occurred to me. I don't think it ever would have occurred to me uh, that Gandalf might simply be Manway in disguise. I mean, that's... Um, that was to me a shocking idea. Um, and so, again, so to me, a question that I don't think I can answer, but I can't help but ask is, why are we talking about this? Like, uh, you know, what, what, uh, why is this even on the table? Um, so who knows? Maybe, maybe the Odin thing is what sort of uh, suggests it. I don't know. Um, but, um, and who, you know, Tom asks another really sensible question. Who are these, uh, who are these many that we're talking, it was believed by many of the faithful of that time that Gandalf was the last appearance of Manway himself. And Tom says, who are these many that he's speaking of? And just how many people knew he was called a lord in the first place? Uh, Tom says he never took Faramir for a blabbermouth, but then Tom later suggests that it was, it was probably Eorth uh, and her sisters uh, who, uh, uh, who overheard this. <laughs> Maybe, we don't know. I, we just don't know. Um, uh, what I would... The sense that I get from that, that many of the faithful of that time reference, it makes me think of uh, Findigil, the king's writer, uh, who transcribed the book of Perianoth, right? The, the guy, you know, the scribe, the Gondorian scribe, uh, who recopied uh, and amended uh, the Red Book down in Gondor. That sort of suggests that, um, it, and especially you combine that reference with the exchange that Gandalf and Aragorn have um, when they discover the sapling of the white tree, right? When Gandalf speaks of Aragorn's responsibility of keeping alive the memory of the times that were, you know, that he, uh, Aragorn, um, and therefore Gondor in general by extension, is going to be the repository of the lore of the ancient world, and that it's their responsibility, that one of their chief responsibilities is to make sure that that lore does not pass utterly out of the world, um, of course, we know that Rivendell has been the chief repository, but that's again, it's 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 fascinating that that's one of the that's the final note struck in Appendix B, right? That that Celeborn um, is you know takes with, you know, when he finally sets out for the Havens, he takes with him the last living memory of the Elder Days in Middle Earth. At that point, the torch is officially passed. Right now, the 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 locus, the center point of memory of the Elder Days is now Gondor, right? That's, and presumably, the kind of, um, uh, the kind of scholarly structure that grows up uh, in Gondor, of which we seem to get a little glimpse uh, in uh, the note from Findigil, King's writer. Um, so it seems to me that uh, Tolkien is sort of uh, pointing to or, or, or implying um, the existence of that kind of scholarly group in Gondor, who is sort of not just the people who were there and experienced it, but this this group of people who are not only documenting carefully what happened in Gondor at the time of the return of Elessar, but connecting that and, 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 and putting all these things together. Remember, a lot of the stuff that we're getting in The Lord of the Rings is stuff that was put together after the fact by later scholars and, and tellers um, and bards. So... Um, you know, this is why we get, for instance, when Theoden, you know, and I've talked about this passage before, when Theoden is leaving Dunharrow and setting off for, uh, 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 for Meduseld, where, where they're going to have the muster and they're going to ride off there. And we get that song, right? You know, and so, so sang, a, a, you know, a, a bard in Rohan much later. Yeah, yeah um, well, that gets included, right? Um, that, uh, that, that little piece of work. So, anyway, um, there's, um, 
that's anyway. That's how I understand this, and I'm gonna, I want to come back to that point actually uh, in a little bit about the uh, um, the way in which so much of what we get in the Lord of the Rings is kind of stuff that's put together after the fact. Um, it, that's brought up, you'll recall, in the uh, in the essay on the Palantiri, which we're going to talk about later uh, in soon, uh, not not that much later. Um, good, good. Let's see. Um, yeah, Charlie points to you know Tolkien, or to, yeah Tolkien saying uh, I don't know uh, because it was for him uh, nearly always a matter of discovery rather than invention. Yes, um, it, it, and I forget who it was um, who who mentioned in the comments last night. Leaf by Niggle. I didn't get to that to reading that comment, um, but it's absolutely right. Um, if you've read Leaf by Niggle, you'll remember there's this question. Or Alyssa, maybe it was you. I can't recall. Um, uh, there's this. Uh, um, there's like an open question, right? Which came first? Niggle's painting of the tree or the tree uh, that Niggle was painting? Um, and there is that, you know, I think that the, the, the way that the relationship between Niggle's painting and the living growing tree, um, the way that that relationship is treated in the story Leaf by Niggle, I think gives the clearest insight that we get anywhere about sort of Tolkien's own theories about and experience of um, what we in the modern world call the creative process. Um, and, uh, and and so, yes, uh, Char- Charlie, I absolutely agree. Th- that is how... Okay, listen, all right. I thought at the last second I remembered that it was you. Good. Um, uh, I, I, it, I, I do think that we see him answering questions this way, or when we see him answering questions this way, again, we're not seeing him toying with people or, you know, playing games, but rather we can see a reflection of that, you know, that he, he hasn't, he hasn't, it's, it's, it's a part of the vista that he can't see from where he's standing, right? He's not conscious of just making stuff up, right? Um, that doesn't, really doesn't seem to be how the process works for him. Um, yeah, yeah, um, Good. Yeah, uh, Alyssa is also reminding me that uh, we could also connect this, the business of the faithful of that time and everything, um, with uh, with the new shadow, um, the uh, the aborted story that Tolkien started writing about Fourth Age Gondor, um, it, by you know the latest thing that is to say, latest in Middle Earth chronology thing that he ever uh, wrote, um, but fairly swiftly abandoned. Um, yeah, we we might we might connect it with that. Um, this note is certainly late enough to connect with in Tolkien's life uh, to connect to connect with any of those things. I think. Um, oh, good, Charlie. At the same time, both Charlie and Alyssa, and in, in the same uh, in the same uh, minute, we're suggesting that connection. Yes, good. Um, Faye is asking a question about the reference to the last appearance of Manway himself. Um, and Faye asks, wait, wait, does this mean that Manway has appeared in Middle-earth before? Um, I, I, my understanding of that is not that he has often appeared in disguise, again, Odin-like. I don't think that's necessarily what's being implied there, but rather that he did, he was in Middle-earth before, you know, in the early stages of the Silmarillion, um, but that since the Valar withdrew to Valinor, he hasn't been back. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good Tom was just pointing that out, too. It suggests there were earlier appearances. Um, uh, maybe. I mean, maybe there is, Tom, as you suggest, a sort of a whole category of Manway sightings that we're never going to be privy to. Possible. Again, that would be very Odin-like. I, you know, absolutely can't rule it out. Um and it might be that kind of a thing uh, that Tolkien had in mind here. I don't know. It, it may simply just be a reference back to the earlier portions of the Silmarillion when the Valar were, you know, spending more time in Middle Earth. Um, uh, yeah, not really sure there. But I also wanted to go back. I was almost not. I didn't include this in the uh, in the PowerPoint for last night, um, and I was. I was going to skip it, but at the end of the day, I just couldn't bear to skip the poetry. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about the poem because it gives us this alliterative poem, right? On this subject, so we have to at least read it, right? Wilt thou learn the lore that was long secret of the five that came from a far country, 
Only one returned, others never again, under men's dominion Middle-earth shall seek, until Dagor Dagoroth and the doom cometh. How hast thou heard it, the hidden counsel of the lords of the west in the land of Amman? The long roads are lost that led thither, to the, and to mortal men Manway speaks not. From the west that was, a wind bore it, to the sleeper's ear, in the silences, under night shadow, when news is brought from lands forgotten and lost ages, over seas of years to the searching thought. Not all are forgotten by the elder king. Sauron he saw as a slow menace. Um, and it's really a shame that this breaks off where it does, because it's... Based on what we have, it sounds like this is going to be a, uh, a, a, a relatively lengthy alliterative verse depiction of the sending of the Astari. We were going to get, like, the whole thing. Like the Valinorian uh, snippet. It sounds like we were going to get, you know, the whole, like, you know, Aloran calling them together and taking volunteers and where is Aloran and, you know, Yavanna being like, hey, Radagast, you know, go along with Saruman and make sure he doesn't get into trouble. Um, so maybe he did fail, actually. Never mind. Um, but, um, Anyway, I mean, it sounds like we're getting... I mean, the, 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 from what we have here, I would speculate that we're getting that whole bit. Let me tell you the two things, three things, that lead me to conclude that based on this fragment that we have. One is the introduction. The first two lines tell us that it declares the topic of the, um, of the story. This is an alliterative verse, which means it is designed for, as, as almost all alliterative verses, it's designed uh, for oral recitation. When you get a poem orally... A title page doesn't do you any good, right? In a printed book, the title page establishes, here's what this work is, um, you know, and here's what it's about. Maybe you get a table of contents, and then you start reading. When you're just listening to something being recited to you, you don't get that. So you tend to begin with a little outline, right? A declaration of what, in fact, this poem is that you're going to be hearing about. And we're being told that this poem is about the five that came from a far country. It's about the coming of the Astari to Middle-earth. So, um, we're told that's the theme, but that's not what we get here. This is clearly not supposed to be, you know, just a you know a fifteen line poem about the Astari, like a like a verse of lore or something like that. We know that because it doesn't talk about the coming of the Astari in these lines, right? We we get you know I I I, I didn't count. We get fifteen ish lines here, right? Um, but this isn't about the Astari. What is it about? It's about how. How Manway communicates with people in the world. That is to say, it's a setup. It's a setup, and it's the the, the fact that we send that we spend this long talking about how hast thou heard it? The hidden counsel of the lords of the west in the land of Amman. Um, what we are going to be told, right? The poet is about to segue into telling us the hidden counsel of the lords of the West, right? We're going to get the narrative of Valinor. Again, this is what that, it is that that makes me believe what, where the poem is going is to an alliterative depiction um, uh, of the, you know, of the debate and discussion of sending the, the Astari and the volunteering of the Maiar. So, um, so the poet begin, it prefaces that by saying, you might wonder how I know this, right? Perhaps you are wondering what is the source of this lore I am about to give you, how I could possibly know um, what was said over there in, uh, in the West that was. And so he goes on to describe this. The long roads are lost that led thither, and to mortal men Manway speaks not. Again, this is like, you are probably going to say there are these obstacles, right? I can't possibly know this because uh, the roads uh, into the west are lost and Manway doesn't speak to mortal men. From the west that was, a wind bore it to the sleeper's ear, in the silences under night shadow, when news is brought from lands forgotten and lost ages over seas of years to the searching thought. That's how by the way, a wind bore it to the sleeper's ear. It was inspired through a dream, he says, in the silences under night shadow, when news is brought from lands forgotten. Um, he said this was brought in a dream. This is, of course, particularly relevant in a p poem on the Astari, because, of course, we know that with Gandalf in particular, whose name, Aloran, is linked to exactly this kind of dream experience, this is, in fact, how it happens. Um, 
Alyssa asks who the sleeper is. The, the poet, I, I, I believe. That if he's not speaking of himself, he's speaking of the poet from whom he got this poem. Um, that is, wh- what is the origin of this? This poem originates in an inspired dream. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to give uh, uh, the exact category of the dream I would expect it to be based upon uh, the dream of Scipio. Sorry, I'm referring to my Chaucer class now where we've been talking about dream vision poems uh, uh, most of the semester. But yes, that does in fact seem to be what he's pointing to. Sandra is also recalling uh, the, 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 the Olore Male, the Path of Dreams, uh, in the Cottage of Lost Play, way back at the beginning of the Book of Lost Tales. Yeah, this idea has been there for a long time, that, uh, that dreams provide a path between a human mortal sleeper and the West. So absolutely, um, it has lots of precedent, both in tradition, both in Tolkien's tradition and in external tradition, and of course is explicitly linked um, with uh, with Oloran, with Gandalf, uh, and the dreams uh, and inspirations that he gives to people. But again, we get that uh, what eight, ten line section just explaining here is where this poem came. from. So this is not the poem, right? This is the this is the introduction to the poem. Uh, We've only gotten as far as saying where the poem came from, and then we get two lines where we're now about to start getting into the meat of the thing, right? Not all are forgotten by the Elder King. Sauron he saw as a slow menace, and presumably decided to do something about that, right? That's that's where we were going to get... So that's why I think... um, These are the cues that I'm seeing in this poem um, about what it was planning to do, and the scope of what it was planning to do. Because you wouldn't spend, like, ten lines like that talking about the source of it if you were just going to be giving, like, a, you know, um, learn now the lore of living creatures, or, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, what brought they from the fallen land over the flowing sea, seven stars and seven... It's not just, like, a little rhymelet talking about the Astari. Um, this is this is going to be a poem, a subst- substantial narrative poem in alliterative verse. Um, I feel, based on the cues, relatively confident in asserting that. But, darn it, <laughs> we don't get it. <laughs> we don't get it. Um, so, ah uh, well. Um, one last note um, about uh, Gandalf from the Astari before we move on to the Palantiri. And then I wanted to, to just give a, a note on Gandalf's name. I know many of you already know this, but I, 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 I wanted to make sure to mention it. Um, Christopher Tolkien mentions that the name Gandalf um, is not uh, an original name. That is, Tolkien derived it uh, from the Elder Edda, that it's the name of a dwarf in the Elder Edda. Um, and the, the, the name seems to mean wand elf, right? And so that that, that uh, etymology, you know, like wand or staff elf, um, and that etymology is used by Tolkien to explain why Gandalf was called Gandalf, because he went around with a staff and they thought he was an elf because he didn't die and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, but it's worth just sort of noting um, that both Tolkien and Christopher in his commentary here is obscuring an interesting fact, which again, is I know a fact many of you know, but that is that the name Gandalf was not originally brought in to the Legendarium by Tolkien as the name of this wizard. Um, the fact that Gandalf is the name of a dwarf in the Velospa is 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 which is a section of the Elder Edda uh, is uh, uh, conspicuous because of course there are many other names of dwarves uh, from that portion of the Elder Edda with which you will also be familiar names like Keeley and Feely and Owen and Glowen and Ori and Nori and all of those um, that is when Tolkien was naming his troop of dwarves in The Hobbit he pulled those names there's this long list of the names of dwarves and so Tolkien was like awesome and so he just lifted from that list of of, of dwarf names uh, in uh, you know from from the Old Norse uh, this list of, of dwarves the, the, the one thing that was kind of puzzling was um uh, was 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 Balin. There's some confusion about Balin. That Balin doesn't seem to be in the list. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'm not going to worry about that right now. 
However, Gandalf, as I said, is one of these dwarf names in this list of dwarf names. And so, as we might expect, that name, Gandalf, was originally applied to one of the dwarves who was, uh, who was getting named ad- after this list. list. That is, the dwarf later known as Thorin Oakenshield. The leader of the troop of dwarves in The Hobbit was originally named Gandalf, and he is referred to as Gandalf throughout the entire first draft of The Hobbit, all the way up until he crawls out of the barrel on the shores of Lake Town. For all of the first draft of The Hobbit leading up to there, it is Bilbo traveling with Gandalf and the troop of dwarves. Now, what was the wizard's name, you ask? Bladorthin was the wizard's name. Um... Bladorthin seems to be a name that uh, Tolkien, which is something we perhaps expect more, um, a name which Tolkien has made up based upon etymologies in his own uh, private languages, rather than a name that he just lifted uh, from this list of dwarves. Um, the idea that he would just sort of take that name out of the Edda and just apply it randomly to Gandalf the wizard would be a little bit unusual. Um, and in fact, that procedure, the procedure that he used for the whole list of dwarves in The Hobbit, was a little unusual based upon his later standards. Um, but the name of the wizard, Bladorthin, now, as a sort of, it, 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 it remains as an Easter egg. Um, if you read The Hobbit carefully, you may notice that the name Bladorthin still occurs in The Hobbit when they are exploring the treasure trove of Thror um, uh, in the Not at Home chapter. They see uh, a, a armor that was made for King Bladorthin, uh, but was never delivered. Um, uh, and, and it's still there in the treasure hoard of, of Thror. So the name Bladorthin uh, still makes a cameo appearance uh, in The Hobbit, but it is no longer that. Yet, yeah, uh, Noam is pointing out that Balin is the brother of Balan uh, in Mallory's uh, Mort d'Arthur. I, Noam, I'm very resistant to that identification. I, 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 I doubt that Balin the Dwarf was named after Sir Balin uh, in Mallory. I doubt that with every bone in my body. Um, I, uh, I, I, I mean, I can't prove where else it came from, um, but I just knowing Mallory and knowing Sir Balin and uh, looking at the two of them, I just I feel like it. Um, that that reason for the name of Balin is worse than any other reason or unreason that I can think of <laughs> to quote somebody else. Um, I just I just I absolutely don't buy it. Just just for the record. Anyway, um, yeah yeah yeah. Anyhow, so um, uh, so it is. Uh, it, the history of Gandalf's name, therefore, is kind of interesting in this way, and the way in which Tolkien does, you know, what he so often did, which is to take the etymology of it. That is, he takes the, etymo- the, the etymology of Gandalf, the actual name of the Velospa dwarf, which has been shifted and put onto the wizard halfway through, or two-thirds of the way through, the composition of The Hobbit, um, and then it sticks, um, but now he has to explain it in the larger context, outside The Hobbit, and outside of, uh, you know, in, in sort of the larger world, and the development of all the different languages and everything, and so he manages to do this, and to make it work, uh, and to make it make sense. But it's a class example of uh, the way that Tolkien can sort of patch and fit everything together. Uh, I just, I, I, I don't know any author who is better at retcon, uh, at, at creating retroactive consistency with things than Tolkien was. He was so brilliant at it. Uh, it's just fantastic. But there was some serious retcon going on there. And Yana, by the way, I absolutely uh, agree with you that um, I'm glad he changed Bladorthin to uh, uh, to Gandalf also. Not quite as glad as I am that he changed Bingo Baggins to Frodo Baggins, but it's 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 close. I gotta tell you, it's close. Um, uh, anyway, um, but I, l- l- let me go on and talk about the Palantiri, in fact. Okay. Um, this, uh, well, actually, hang on, before I do this, um, let me let me start off with one little introduction here. Let's recall here the context of the Palantiri. If you remember from the introduction, which was now hundreds of pages and and uh, uh, and uh, lots of weeks ago, a dozen of weeks ago, um, 
we uh, the the Palantir the the stuff that's in the the essay on the Palantir here in the final chapter of Unfinished Tales is a, is a bunch of notes that Christopher Tolkien has pieced together. He says in the introduction, all he's done is kind of put them together so that they make a consistent essay, whereas they were just like a bunch of scattered notes that Tolkien had drawn up for himself. The context and date of them is around 1966. There was a second edition of The Lord of the Rings coming out, and there were a couple things that Tolkien wanted to tweak and change, and in the process of doing that, he was rethinking and sort of ironing out some of his ideas about the Palantiri, and that's when he wrote those notes. Um, so this is significantly later um, than the, uh, the the essay on the Astari that we were looking at last night. You know, so that was the essay on the Astari, like the Quest of Erebor. That's the stuff that was written during the publication process of the Lord of the Rings. So, you know, things that was you know that were designed to be in the appendices. You know, designed to be part of the apparatus of the of the originally published. Lord of the Rings. Here now we're looking at him, him looking back at the Lord of the Rings, um, thinking in terms of revisions and rethinkings of things. So that's the context uh, of the Palantiri. It's important to note that um, he, the Palantir is also another example of something which came into Tolkien's mind, or again, to use the language I was referring to earlier, it is a it is a branch on the tree that he only discovered when he came to this part of the Lord of the Rings. Um, when Wormtongue chucks a dark, a ball of dark crystal out of an upper window at Gandalf's head, Tolkien didn't seem to have any idea what the thing was. Uh, in fact, if I'm remembering correctly, in the very first the very first time it appears in his drafts and, and, and outlines, it shatters when it hits the ground. Um, I might be wrong about that, but that's what I think I remember. Um, but in any case, uh, the history of what happened with it, um, you know, the story as it was unfolding from there, and Tolkien's initial thinking was quite different. For one thing, Gandalf did look into it. Um, that is, once he got past the it shattered on the stone, and he decided, okay, no, it didn't shatter on the stone, it's going to be more important than that. Gandalf, in fact, did look in it. And you remember the, 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 the description that Pippin gives of seeing sort of the darkness and the, the shapes like bats wheeling and circling around? That's what Gandalf sees. So Gandalf looks in the ball, and he... Uh, and he sees it, and there's this delightfully ambiguous passage. Even Christopher Tolkien laughs at it uh, in his commentary. Um, oh, and by the way, that wh- where I'm where I'm getting this stuff all from is from the War of the Ring. Um, this is uh, Volume Three of the History of the Lord of the Rings uh, series, which makes it Book Eight of uh, the History of Middle Earth series. Um, anyway, uh, th- anyway, th- in the commentaries. <laughs> Christopher Tolkien um, makes uh, makes he, he sort of makes makes fun of this moment. In the outline, it sounds like Gandalf is talking to somebody in the in the in the in the globe in the in the crystal, um, and he says to him like, "Hang on, I don't have time to talk to you right now. I'm <laughs> I'm busy." And Christopher Tolkien just finds it delightful to think of Gandalf coming into confrontation with Sauron and being like, uh, "Hang on, uh, I'll get back to you. Uh, I I just don't have time right now." Um, it's just, it's just sort of a, an awesome and funny moment. Um, but, um, anyway, so as a Tolkien, he didn't, he didn't know for sure what this thing was. He certainly didn't know how it worked. Um, and its role in the story was really unclear. So just keep in mind, um, like so many of the other things that we've looked at, the Druidine, uh, Galadriel, you know, a, a bunch of things like this, um, the whole concept of the Palantiri is something which grew out of the composition process of the Lord of the Rings, and which he's then refining after the facts. So we've got to remember that uh, for a general context. Now, one of the other things that we see, now I'll advance to my next slide, is in, again, some of that early drafting material, uh, Gandalf's first thoughts about the Palantir are quite different uh, than what we eventually see in the published book. Very odd. Very, this, is, this is Gandalf speaking. Very odd how things work out. But I begin now to wonder a little, he stroked his beard. Was this ball really thrown to slay me after all? Or to slay me if it might, and to do something else if it missed? Was it thrown without Saruman's knowledge? Hmm. Things may have been meant to go much as they have gone, except that you looked in, not me. Hmm. Well, they have gone so, and not otherwise, and it is so that we have to deal with. But come. 
This must change our plans. We are being careless and leisurely. He's talking to Pippin, right? Who's the the, uh, the the he switches to have Pippin look into it relatively quickly. Gandalf looking in it doesn't last for very long. Then he switches to the Pippin incident. But this is this is Gandalf's comment on this. And now now we segue here to Christopher Tolkien's commentary against the paragraph beginning very odd, very odd how things work out. My father wrote in the margin, no. Because if Saruman had wished to warn Mordor of the ruin of Isengard and the presence of Gandalf and hobbits, he had only to use glass in normal fashion and inform Sauron direct. But he may have wished A. to kill Gandalf, B. to get rid of the link. Sauron may have been pressing him to come to the stone. He evidently decided that these were unprofitable speculations and abandoning the direction Gandalf's words had taken returned to an earlier point in his final address to Pippin. That is to say... One of Tolkien's plans here, in the you know in in the in the first version of the Pippin looks in the stone um, uh, concept of the story, Tolkien considers having Saruman plan to give Gandalf the 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 Palantir as a kind of booby trap, right? He can he can accomplish two ends. On the one hand, he can basically use it as a trap for Gandalf, is Gandalf is probably going to look in it. And if Gandalf looks in it, he'll be revealed to Sauron, and then he'll be in a bundle of trouble. In fact, maybe Sauron will bind Gandalf to his will, just as he bound Saruman to his will, and then Gand- uh, Saruman can sit back and gloat over the fact that he's like essentially, in, uh, you know, it, it, like infected Gandalf with the same sickness that he has. Um, and also, by the way, if that happens, shown himself that he's not, in fact, actually worse than or weaker than Gandalf. Because, look, the same thing happened to Gandalf when he was put in that same position. So you can see how that would have a kind of appeal for Sauron, so, or for Saruman. So if, you know, plan A, brain Gandalf with the sphere, right? Because that would be really satisfying. But if he fails to brain Gandalf with the sphere, then he's basically you know, put a put a put a booby trap in Gandalf's possession, right? I mean it's like a this thing is practically like a time bomb that's gonna go off. And it has the extra side effect of removing the link. So now he can't even be tempted. He doesn't want to report uh to Sauron in the sphere um and have to confess to him all these things. So he is going and of course if he just refuses to, Sauron's gonna get ticked off. But if Sauron sees that Gandalf has it, see then Saruman's off the hook again too. Saruman can be like, dude, man, what can I do? It was taken away from me, right? Sucks I know, but you know, gosh. So in fact this is kind of an interesting plan by Saruman. Now Tolkien ended up scrapping this and decided that there was no way Saruman was gonna voluntarily give up the Palantir. Um but it's just fascinating to notice. Um that this was... Okay, good. Alyssa and uh, Charlie have both confirmed for me that my memory was correct, uh, that it uh, that it splintered on the rock beside the stair when it fell. The, the very first time it appears, um, it shattered, and then he changed his mind about the shattering. Um, so, uh, so, so you can see, you know, one of the points that I'm trying to make here is, is um, what a... Um, uh, what a kind of an open... Um, you know, a... a, a a clean slate this whole concept was um, for Tolkien as he was writing this. Um, but, uh, but so just, you know, keep in mind in the discussion we're going to be having, this is sort of where the Palantir concept started and from what it grew. Now, let's look at what we actually learn about the Palantir in the essay. First, the nature of the Palantiri. The Palantiri were no doubt never matters of common use or common knowledge, even in Numenor. In Middle-earth, they were kept in guarded rooms. High and strong towers, only kings and rulers and their appointed wardens had access to them, and they were never consulted nor exhibited publicly. But until the passing of the kings, they were not sinister secrets. Their use involved no peril, and no king or other person authorized to survey them would have hesitated to reveal the source of his knowledge of the deeds or opinions of distant rulers if obtained through the stones." It was not a sinister secret. Now, this actually picks up on a reference that uh, you can find in the War, in the War of the Ring. There, when Tolkien is initially thinking through these ideas, he expresses in the margin a slight concern that the Palantir might come to sound too much like a ring. Right? That is to say, you know, that its possession can corrupt you, and that Sauron uses it to bind Saruman to his will, and so therefore, you know, it's just like another ring or like an alternative ring. Like we're just you know, sort of doing the same thing. Um, and uh, Tolkien is quick to emphasize, we see, in this later essay, this 1966 essay, now coming back to this um, 
20 years after the drafting that you know, the passage that we were just looking at was like 1942 um, in uh, you know 1966 10 years you know 10 12 years after the publication um, of the book he's now returning to it and he's again still wanting to emphasize it's not like a ring the possession of a palantir does not corrupt you it doesn't eat away at you and but we would have reason to think this right because of the effect it had on pippin right um, it's Pippin's actions more than anything else, and you know Saruman's issues uh, secondarily, but Pippin's response in particular, which might lead us very naturally to assume that the Palantir had this kind of infectious draw, you know, on people. And Tolkien is quick to say, no, 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 they're not in themselves sinister. They're not addictive. They're not, um, you know, they're not going to dominate your will. You're not going to become a slave. You're not going to become like a a, a palantir wraith. Not going to happen. Um, and that although, you know, they weren't public things. You know, we don't. You know, in Numenor, they didn't. You know, in neither in Numenor nor in ancient Gondor or ancient Arnor, you know, did they have Palantiri set up on, you know, on, 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 on pillars in the town square so that anybody could go along and use it. They weren't public things, but, um, but at the same time, they weren't, they weren't a sinister secret. People would, would, would talk about it. The king would talk about it. You know, he would not have hesitated to reveal the source of his knowledge if obtained through the stones. The Palantiri are instruments. They are powerful instruments. They give you knowledge. They can be used very easily to increase the power and influence of the person wielding them. Therefore, they're dangerous. But the danger lies in the person who uses it and and why they use it and what they're getting out of it or wanting to get out of it. That's where the danger lies, not in the artifact itself. It is not like the one ring um, you know, which if you buried it beneath the roots of the mountain, still it would eat, you know, it would gnaw your mind away. That's not how the Palantir would work. So that's the first thing that Tolkien is very quick and firm uh, to, 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 to emphasize here. Um, yeah, good. Faye is, uh, and I, I mean, yeah, Sandra's saying, well, you know, uh, Denethor also seems to show this. I agree we could interpret Denethor as depicted in The Return of the King as being in some sense corrupted by the Palantir. I don't think even that is clear. To me, the only thing that sounds ringish is Pippin with his itchy palms uh, and his the way that it does seem to be eating away at his mind, which seems to be more than just Hobbit curiosity. Mary's reaction seems to suggest that it's more than just Hobbit curiosity. Um, Denethor, both Denethor and Saruman's um, reactions and their act, and you know, but the, what they say and what they think and their relationships with the Palantiri, I think, are are explicable in other ways. As Gandalf, uh, not Gandalf, as Tolkien, in fact, goes on to explain in in, in Gandalf's words um, uh, at times, but but as he goes on in this essay to explain more fully how that relationship worked. But it's I, to me, it's Pippin's actions that need most explaining, or rather, that most set up that idea of uh, of it as a um, it as a ring like thing. Um, I agree with you, Fay. Fay says uh, he makes it clear that your will dictates the uh, the stone and not the other way around. The stones are static, not dynamic. Yes, the stone itself is a static thing. Um, it is. Um, it's not quite like a modern machine. Right, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a telephone. You know, it, it's not, it's not like the internet or something like that. Um, of course, there have been many jokes about, uh, um, you know, our classroom interface here at Mythgard. You know, uh, uh, and uh, um, thinking about, uh, you know, using these sessions as, as you know, being like looking into a palantir. Um, but uh, there are some significant differences there. But in one way, in the fact that it is merely the passive instrument by which, um, uh, you know, by which two human beings or more than two human beings communicate, um, in that way, it is like. Um, but let's go on and look at uh, other things he says about it. Now, this this is where I wanted to come back to. I meant one of the things I mentioned before that I wanted to come back to, and that is uh, the the ref this reference which I find fascinating and really. Um, uh, really edifying about the state of 
memory and lore in Gondor. The second reason that is for the why people are all sort of forgetting about the stone, the stones. The second reason was the decay of Gondor and the waning of interest in or knowledge of ancient history among all but a few, even of the high men of the realm, except insofar as it concerned their genealogies, their descent and kinship. Gondor, after the kings declined into a middle age of fading knowledge and simpler skills, the middlemen thing that Faramir was talking about, remember? communications depended on messengers and errand riders, or in times of urgency upon beacons, and if the stones of Honor and Orthanc were still guarded as treasures out of the past, known to exist only by a few, the seven stones of old were by the people generally forgotten, and the rhymes of lore that spoke of them were, if remembered, no longer understood. Their operations were transformed in legend into the elvish powers of the ancient kings with their piercing eyes, and the swift, bird-like spirits that attended on them, bringing them news or bearing their messages. We have to remember. Um, remember when I was talking about Findegil, the king's writer, and how when we read The Lord of the Rings, we have to remember we're getting something prepackaged. We're getting something which includes not just the knowledge of the people who were there, but also, in large part, the speculation of uh, the the speculation and intelligent conclusions of the people who came after the fact and put all these things together in retrospect, right? Um, and this is one of the things I think which sometimes is. Uh, can lead to problems in understanding parts of the narrative. Um, we forget that people don't, even the wise, don't always have access to all the information of the Elder Days. Um, remember, we talked about this at the very beginning of Unfinished Tales. We also talked about it in the Appendices classes, uh, in, the, in the Return of the King class. Um, Tolkien spoke in his letters of this sort of dangerous temptation to the accumulation of lore, that he really likes answering questions that people have about lore and putting everything together and working everything out. He loves doing that. But he admitted that it's potentially a problem, that there are, some, there are going to be some people who won't like it, um, who prefer you know, the, the, the heroic story themselves and find that more lore decreases their enjoyment of the story. This is a way in which I think that increased lore does decrease it. We forget that we're privileged. That is... We have, in holding the three volumes of The Lord of the Rings in our hands, we have access to much, much more information in one place than almost anyone in Middle-earth has um, at the time of the story. Even Gandalf doesn't have all that information, because it includes things that are put together after the War of the Ring. Like, remember the passage uh, in the Isildur chapter in Unfinished Tales, which, ta which g gives the now... You know the true story of Isildur now revealed based on uh, subsequent archaeological discoveries, right? Um, in particular, the discovery of the Elendilmir in Orthanc after the war. Well, um, you know this. Um, that's just one example of how we're getting packaged for us um, both information and speculation that is you know within the fictional frame put together by lots of people after all of these things are known. And that's all very far from the experience of the people on the ground, even people on the ground like Gandalf and Radagast and Elrond and, uh, and, uh, and even Galadriel. Even the people who've been around a long time didn't see all these things happening. Um, uh, because, you know, Middle-earth is big. Um, and it takes more than it takes... It takes more time than it takes characters in Peter Jackson films to travel from one end of, of Middle-earth to the other. Um, and word just doesn't travel perfectly, or clearly, or soon to everybody. Here we get a glimpse of what uh, even the history of Gondor is like to your average Gondorian person on the street. It's been mythologized. They know the traditions of Numenor. They know that Gondor has a great and illustrious past, but they have come to see that past as part of, um, you know, again, this, this almost um, magical time in the past, right? That, that they know that their ancestors, um, the, you know, Isildur and his people, and before them, the, the kings of Numenor, they know that they were great and could do things that, that, that they, the modern Gondorians, can't and couldn't possibly even understand. Um, 
they 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 merely tell stories of the elvish powers of the ancient kings with their piercing eyes and the swift bird-like spirits that attended on them. These are the stories that have grown up in Numenor since then. Um, so, I just think this this is a really interesting glimpse and in a, in a really really we almost have to be reminding ourselves of this continually when we're reading the Lord of the Rings that this stuff is just not known. Um, it's just not known by almost anybody. The time spans involved are really large. The distance between, um, you know, Eorth, uh, uh, wise woman of Gondor, as Gandalf calls her, the, the distance between Eorth and the last king of Gondor is greater than the distance between us and the Viking discovery of North America for instance. I mean, it's a long time ago. It is ancient, ancient history. And you think of the gap, a gap very present in Tolkien's mind um, from his scholarly studies. You think of the gap between the Anglo-Saxon period and the Roman period. We're only talking about a couple hundred years there. And yet, the relics of the Roman period, you know, the, the aqueducts, the public baths, you know, all these buildings and things that were left, the roads, for crying out loud, that were left by the Romans after the Romans vacated um, uh, Britain. And you've got, um, you know, the Britons and then the Angles and Saxons um, living here still among these old Roman ruins. They see things like the aqueducts and, you know, call it you know, famous as is fa- as is speculated, you know, famously in the poem, "The Wanderer Enter Your Way Ark," the work of giants, ents, um, which just means giant in Anglo-Saxon. You know, this is Enter Your Way Ark, um, the work of giants of times past. And again, that's like three hundred years, four hundred years, or a really short time. Um, so uh, compared to the time in Gondor. Anyway. Um, this I just thought was, it's, you know, so okay, so sort of digressing from talking about the Palantiri here, but I thought that this paragraph conveys more clearly than m- most other passages that I can think of. Think, I mean, this is a, this I think is a wonderful, wonderful passage for getting a clearer glimpse, a clearer reminder um, of that, what I think is a really important fact. Okay, anyway, back to the Palantiri. Saruman had no doubt from his investigations gained a special knowledge of the stones, things that would attract his attention, and had become convinced that the Orthanc stone was still intact in its tower. Um, He would know about this where the rest of the White Council wouldn't, because A, he has done more research in Gondor, as we know, and B, this is exactly the kind of thing that he would have done research into. Hmm, what artifacts of power may still be lying about that I could make use of, right? That's the kind of research project that Saruman was frightfully keen on. Um... He acquired the keys of Orthanc in 2759, nominally as Warden of the Tower and Lieutenant of the Stewards of Gondor. At that time, the matter of the Orthanc Stone would hardly concern the White Council. Only Saruman, having gained the favor of the Stewards, had yet made sufficient study of the records of Gondor to perceive the interest of the Palantiri and the possible uses of those that survived. But of this he said nothing to his colleagues. Owing to Saruman's jealousy and hatred of Gandalf, he ceased to cooperate with the council, which last met in 2953. That is, when, uh, when Sauron was driven out of Mirkwood. That's, that's you know, the, the year of the Hobbit. Without any formal declaration, Saruman then seized Isengard as his own domain. He's already been living there, right? But at this point, he ceases to, be, to consider himself answerable to the steward of Gondor seized Isengard as his own domain and paid no further attention to Gondor. The council no doubt disapproved of this, but Saruman was a free agent and had the right, if he wished, to act independently according to his own policy in the resistance to Sauron. So the White Council knew that Saruman was setting up on his own, that he had claimed Orthanc for himself, that he had claimed Isengard for himself. They're okay with this because it's like, well, you know, it's a strategic position. We looked at that, you know, previously. Um, it's a good idea to have Saruman there. Um, you know, the whole I claim this tower to myself thing, you know, obviously Gandalf would consider that kind of thing bad form, but, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily scream evil. The council in general must independently have known of the stones and their ancient dispositions, but they did not regard them as much of much present importance. They were things that belonged to the history of the kingdoms of the Dúnedain, marvelous and admirable, but mostly now lost or rendered of little use. 
it must be remembered that the stones were originally innocent, serving no evil purpose. It was Sauron who made them sinister, and instruments of domination and deceit. So, again, this is... The, we can clearly hear there's a question that Tolkien's answering in this passage. And, you know, in these notes that he's writing for himself, and the question is, why didn't the White Council... Um, why didn't the White Council do something? Why didn't they know about the Palantiri? How, how, how could they let this happen? And he says, look, man, it's really simple. Did they know of the existence of the Palantiri? Yeah, yeah, they probably knew, right? If you pin them down and ask them, um, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, Elrond, could you list for me the, like, you know, major relics of Numenor that were possessed, you know, by Elendil and Isildur when they arrived in Middle-earth? He probably could have me- would have mentioned the Palantiri as things that existed, right? But it's not relevant. No one has talked about them or done anything with them for thousands of years. The White Council has more important things to think about. Notice this is what he's emphasizing down there at the bottom. It must be remembered that the stones were originally innocent, serving no evil purpose. That is to say, it's not like they were leaving these, you know, ignoring these seriously dangerous things. It's not like, you know, there are these two radioactive things out there that the council's like, oh yeah, whatever, let's just not worry about that and do something else. And then, you know, in retrospect, they're kicking themselves for forgetting about the Palantiri. No, they were, they were irrelevant. They're not dangerous, necessarily. Um, and especially recall the, fa- the fact that uh, Tolkien emphasizes in this essay, most people believed that the Ithil Stone had been destroyed. So they're not even starting with the basic, you know, uh, starting point of, granted, Sauron has a Palantir and uses it, right? Um, if you start with that, you know, if, if, if you, um, if the White Council discussion began there, point of, you know, a, 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 a discussion point, Sauron has a Palantir. What should we do? You know, I bet people would have thought, well, gosh, maybe we should think about the other Palantir and, and maybe we should look to secure those because that's probably not a good thing uh, to leave floating around. In fact, maybe we should talk to Denethor about this in particular, right? Um, but that's not what was on the table. Um, they, uh, they, they wouldn't have been... Charlie, you're also right to point out um, that the White Council would properly have had neither right nor authority over the Seven Stones. Yeah, it, it's also kind of not their business. Now, you could say, if they had reason to believe, as later in retrospect they did have reason to believe, that they were a danger in the war against Sauron, that they were a weakness of the West in its war against Sauron, that would have given them not the right to go in and seize them or something, but a good cause to do some in- inquiry and, and to, to, to ask some questions. But um, but they didn't. And, you know, again, Tolkien's overall answer to the question, why didn't the White Council think about this, is there was no reason why they should have. It's not even odd. It's not even a little bit odd that they didn't do that. Um, when you think about the whole thing in context. Fortunately, they had Pippin, though. Pippin helped. It is evident that at, that at the time of the War of the Ring, the Council had not long become aware of the doubt concerning the fate of the Ithil Stone. They'd only just realized, wait a second, maybe the Ithil Stone wasn't destroyed. And failed, understandable, understandably, even in such persons as Elrond, Goadriel, and Gandalf, under the weight of their cares, to appreciate its significance, to consider what might be the result if Sauron became possessed of one of the stones, and anyone else should then and, and, and anyone else should then make use of another. It needed the demonstration on, to- on Dalbaran of the effects of the Orthanc stone on Peregrine to reveal suddenly that the link between Isengard and Barad-dûr seemed to exist after it was discovered that forces of Isengard had been joined with others directed by Sauron in the attack on the Fellowship at Parthgalan was in fact the Orthanc stone and one other Palantir. This is the first time when Gandalf recognizes, oh boy, this is a problem, right? This is a potential problem. They didn't even know. They they had only just started to guess that he might have a Palantir, and it frankly didn't seem important. Um, and there's every reason why it wouldn't have seemed important, but now all of a sudden it does, and I really love the fact, um, love the reference to the fact that part of Gandalf's haste to get to Minas Tirith 
is that now he's worried about Denethor. Oh, shoot. What happens if Denethor looked into this, too? Because um, basically, he's imagining, what if I get to Minas Tirith and I find Orthanc? Right? Could happen. Could happen. That is, you know, I find the situation in, 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 in Minas Tirith to be the same as the, 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 the position in Orthanc. In fact, from one uh, way of looking at it, it would be more likely, right? I mean, Saruman is Saruman. Denethor is, is lesser. He's just a guy. Right, um, so if if Saruman was was overpowered by Sauron by this means, um, you know, and in this way, what about what's what's up with Denethor? Um, that that could get awfully ugly. Um, so this is what he's this is what he's thinking about. Here's a passage which contains actual revision, um, actual revision in a way that I find particularly fun. Gandalf should have been reported as saying that he did not think that Denethor had presumed to use it. Um, this is given to us in the Lord of the Rings as a fact, right? Um, Denethor did not in his early days presume to use it. Um, we are led to believe that Denethor only began to look in the Palantir after Boromir left, right? That's what the text of the Lord of the Rings leads us to believe. Uh, well, what I should say, Gandalf in the text leads us to believe about Denethor and his use of the Palantir. Now, in the, revi- in the revised essay, Tolkien's changing his mind. Now, we're going to rewrite Denethor's story a little bit, and it's kind of interesting. He could not state it as a known fact. Gandalf, you went beyond your sources. Gandalf, shame on you. For when and why Denethor had dared to use the stone was and remains a matter of conjecture. Gandalf might well think as he did on the matter, but it is probable, considering Denethor and what is said about him, that he began to use the Honor Stone many years before uh, 3019, that is, when when Boromir leaves, and earlier than Saruman ventured or thought it useful to use the Stone of Orthanc. So Denethor probably used it prior to Saruman. That's interesting. Um, He's been doing this for longer than Saruman. Denethor was succeeded to the stewardship in 2984, being then 54 years old, a masterful man, both wise and learned beyond the measure of those days, and strong-willed, confident in his own powers, and dauntless. So, he's got excellent... He, he might be just a guy, but he's got excellent raw materials here. His grimness was first observable to others after his wife Finduilus died in, 19, in 2988, but it seems fairly plain that he had at once returned to the stone as soon as he came to power. Having long studied the matter of the Palantiri and the traditions regarding them and their use, preserved in the special archives of the stewards, available, beside the ruling steward, only to his heir. During the end of the rule of his father, Ichthelion II, he must have greatly desired to consult the stone, as anxiety in Gondor increased, while his own position was weakened by the fame of Thorongil and the favor shown to him by his father. At least one of his motives must have been jealousy of Thorongil and hostility to Gandalf, to whom, during the ascendancy of Thorongil, his father paid much attention. Denethor desired to surpass these usurpers in knowledge and information, and also, if possible, to keep an eye on them when they were elsewhere. So, Denethor used it at the beginning. As soon as he became steward, he started using it. And his reasons for wanting to use it in the first place? Envy. Envy. Envy of Gandalf, and most importantly, of Thorongil, that is, of Aragorn, uh, uh, in his youth establishing himself in Gondor and being a captain of, uh, of Ichthelion's armies, as we read about in Appendix A. Um, we can see here already a parallel between Denethor and Saruman, right? Um, w- that is, this sounds a lot like, not exactly the same as, but a lot like the envy that Saruman had for Gandalf, right? Okay. More. The breaking strain of Denethor's confrontation of Sauron must be distinguished from the general strain of using the stone. The latter Denethor thought he could endure, and not without reason. Confrontation with Sauron almost certainly did not occur for many years, and was probably never originally contemplated by Denethor. For the uses of the Palantiri and the distinction between their solitary use for seeing and their use for communication with another respondent stone and its surveyor, See page uh, 411. Denethor could, after he had acquired the skill, learn much of distant events 
by the use of the Anor Stone alone, and even after Sauron became aware of his operations, he could still do so, as long as he retained the strength to control his stone to his own purposes, in spite of Sauron's attempt to wrench the Anor Stone always towards himself. Saruman is ensnared, right? He uses the stone for his own purpose, and then, out of curiosity, out of arrogance, Gandalf suggests, he looks at Barad-dûr, right? And there he's caught, and his will is ensnared by Sauron's will, and Saruman can no longer resist, and becomes a kind of thrall to Sauron through the long-distance agency of the Palantir. Denethor didn't. He didn't use it to seek out Sauron. That's not what he wanted. But he is continually, his will is continually at war with Sauron's will. He is, in fact, wrestling against his enemy um, while he's in the Palantir, simply because Sauron is trying to draw him over to look at him, which presumably he did with Saruman as well. Only Saruman fails. Um, to resist that temptation, Denethor succeeds to re in resisting that temptation, and that's really interesting. It must also be considered that the stones were only a small item in Sauron's vast designs and operations, a means of dominating and deluding two of his opponents, but he would not and could not have the Ithil stone under perpetual observation. It was not his way to commit such instruments to the use of subordinates, nor had he any servant whose mental powers were superior to Saruman's or even to Denethor's. Um, that's a really important reminder, right? Um, when uh, Pippin looks into the stone, there's Sauron there. And, and when Aragorn looks into the stone, there's Sauron there, right? So uh, it, it's sort of a logical connection to believe that, you know, uh, Sauron's got one set up like you know, I don't know where. He, like, mounts it in his bedroom or something, so that, like, uh, you know, round the clock, it, it's, it's, it's right there, he's always ready to look. Um, no. It's not, it's only a, this is only a small thing. I mean, it's a useful tool. He's managed to corrupt both Denethor and Saruman in different ways, but it's not like Saruman's got better things to do than sit around and stare into the Palantir all the time, right? So, um, so that's, that's an important thing. So we see the difference in Denethor's approach, even though his motivations are similar to Saruman, that is, envy and the desire to increase his own power, um, his, his, uh, his actual use of the stone is quite different um, than Saruman's, and he actually really does better. Um, the, the note there at the end is a very interesting one. Um, Faye, you were talking about this by email. I thought you made a really good point here. In the essay on the Palantiri, Faye says, Tolkien talks about the way Saruman uses his stone. It was not his way to commit such instruments to the use of subordinates. Although a minor point when it comes to the essay, this struck me as directly opposite to the way good works in Tolkien. Iluvatar delegates to the Valar great power, the Valar to the Maiar, Iluvatar to men, Gandalf to Frodo, etc. Good things trust and delegate to those below them, wherein lies their strength whereas here we see Sauron's weakness for not allowing his servants to do anything out of their own will or on their own. Absolutely. I think that's, that's, that's really correct and very well said. We do see this again and again. I think that this is pointing to a major trend, and it is a major weakness. There's a kind of paradox there, isn't there? The evil, um, uh, the evil people, creatures, in Sauron will never serve. They will only command. Right? Um, and... Uh, because they, they won't lower themselves. They won't reduce themselves. They refuse to be humble. They are proud. Um, they think very highly of themselves um, and uh, therefore will not delegate work to anybody else, right? Because that, be, that would be weak. They, they want to do it themselves, to be in control, to have the power over the thing. Um, and whereas the good guys are always delegating things, um, and we see the weak people doing great things, but of course the strong undermine themselves by this strategy, right? We see the power of the weak in Tolkien, and we also see how the strength of Melkor and of Sauron are limited. You know, the One Ring, the forging of the One Ring being the obvious example, the fatal weakness that ends up destroying Sauron, but, um, but more than that, we see uh, um, uh, we see them uh, um, uh, 
I just, I, I, I just agree. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. But I, I, I do agree with Faith that this is a really important trend um, that we can see. Um, and I think there's, there, there's a lot of examples that we could look at. It's another really interesting paper topic, by the way. Um, yeah, good. Oh, uh, Tom, uh, this is a good question. I will mention, I will mention this. Um, Tom says, if Pippin was facing east by chance, Aragorn appears to have started by facing east on purpose, a direct and open challenge, as we know. Both of them suffered for it, which gives us some idea of the experience of Saruman and Denethor when they faced Sauron. Yes, yes. Now, the the business about the polarization of the Palantiri and how they have to be they have to be turned right side up, and then you know you have to be looking around like the right angle in order to see. Um, and initially, the point that Tolkien makes about that is that basically it was a it was a complete fluke. Pippin picks up this unmarked sphere. You know, there's no arrow pointing up, or you know, no indication of the pole. There's no this side up written around. You know, the top of the palantir or anything. He just puts it on the ground, more or less upright. Happens to sit down facing east so that he can line up with with Sauron. And Tolkien emphasizes this was a this was good luck, as as, as it's called. That is, he is emphasizing the serendipity of this. He's emphasizing what he appears to be calling the role of some higher power. This is destiny taking a hand here. Um, it would have been very unlikely to have just happened by luck. We should remember, Christopher tells us that in a later note, Tolkien says he's going to scrap that idea, that he, he changed his mind um, about the polarization orientation thing of it, that, 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 that that's not how it works. Um, and uh, I, I have to admit, I don't like that very much. I think his later idea of pitching that is a better one. Um, it seems to, it always seemed to me to make it too mechanical. Um, that if it's all about, as he as he emphasizes in other places, if it's all about the will of the person looking into it, you wouldn't think that like turning your head would really make that much difference, right? So um, anyway, uh, yeah. Charlie, that's a really good point. Charlie says, with the unwillingness to delegate comes a similar failure of imagination. Uh, no one will or could behave other than I would, thinketh Sauron. Yeah, yeah, I think we can see sort of a, a relation there. Um, a way in which when somebody considers only themselves, right, when when they only think of themselves, they end up thinking only about themselves, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that we, we, can, we can sort of see the trend there. Okay, last Denethor passage. In the case of Denethor, the steward was strengthened, even against Sauron himself, by the fact the stones were far more amenable to legitimate users, most of all to true heirs of Elendil, as Aragorn, but also to one with inherited authority, as Denethor, as compared to Saruman or Sauron. It may be noted the, that the effects were different. Saruman fell under the dominion of Sauron and desired his victory, or no, lo no longer opposed it. Denethor remained steadfast in his rejection of Sauron, but was made to believe that his victory was inevitable, and so fell into despair. He is deceived. He is manipulated by the will of Sauron, but not dominated by the will of Sauron. The will of Sauron failed to dominate Denethor as it succeeded in dominating Saruman. And the implication here is that, in, in part, this is because Denethor was stubborn as nails uh, and had a really strong will of his own, possibly as strong or stronger than Saruman's. But the larger point here that he's making in this particular context is it also matters that the stones were more amenable to legitimate users. That is, in the hand of Sauron, who was an illegitimate user, really the most illegitimate of users of the Palantir, it was a very limited instrument in his hand. He, and especially since the purpose he was trying to put it to, that is, as the mechanism through which he could apply his will to dominate the minds of others, um, that is that is not... How, like Basically, Sauron's like trying to jailbreak the Palantir here and, and devote it to a use that for which it was not programmed. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, it doesn't do it perfectly um, there's it's it's like there's there's some kind of buffer denethor is um, is b by implication here in a sense insulated um, from the full blast of Sauron's will because he is a legitimate user of the palantir 
Uh, okay, the reasons for this difference were no doubt that in the first place Denethor was a man of great strength of will and maintained the integrity of his personality until the final blow of the apparently mortal wound of his only surviving son. That is to say, what broke his will was not Sauron directly. It contributed, of course, as we see. Um, his despair was a major part of it, but um, it was not Sauron's influence through the Palantir that brought it to be. He was unable to break Denethor. In the end, the apparent, uh, the near fatal wounding of his son um, was uh, was the thing that broke him. Sauron never directly succeeded in breaking him. He was proud, but this was by no means merely personal. He loved Gondor and its people, and deemed himself appointed by destiny to lead them in this desperate time. Yes, yes, that's right. And in the second place, the Anor Stone was his by right, and nothing but expediency was against his use of it in his grave anxieties. Remember, there's nothing sinister about them in themselves, and there's nothing illicit, nothing illicit in Denethor's use of it. He had the perfect right to do that. Remember, uh, Aragorn says, I had the strength, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be used by one who had the right and the strength to use it. The right cannot be questioned, the strength was enough, barely, right? Well, the same is true of Denethor. His right to use the, the Honor Stone cannot be doubted. He is the ruling steward. He has the right to use the stone. Um, and he also had the strength to use the stone. Um, and he's proud, but it's a different kind of pride. Um, here we see the difference between Denethor and Saruman, right? We saw a similarity that his desire for personal power and his, for to use the Palantir originally was influenced by his envy of Aragorn, Thorongil, and of Gandalf. Um, but we see he also, that desire was mixed with positive motives as well. Saruman had the positive motive of, you know, helping in the war against Sauron, but we saw, you know, in other earlier writings, even that was already being corrupted um, by the fact that he really wanted... He was okay being, uh, he was okay, in wor okay working against Sauron for the defense of the West, as long as everybody in the West recognized that he was the most important member of the defense of the West, right? Um, that's different. There's no sense, there, there is none of that kind of selfless, self-forgetful patriotism about, um, about Saruman. But there is about Denethor, and it is an important thing to recall. We can see this even in um, we can see this even in the Lord of the Rings. It's one of the things that's emphasized when he shows uh, Pippin that he's wearing a sword that he's armored underneath, and says that he has slept in his armor for many years. Denethor is almost ascetic. Um, that is, uh, oh, like a monk or something. He is he has been mortifying his flesh. Um, there's a kind of pride in it, but 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 there's also a lot of selflessness in it as well. He is sacrificing himself for the defense of his realm. That's how he sees it. Um, this is why, by the way, one of my least favorite scenes in the Peter Jackson films is the Denethor eating scene. That is totally un-Denethor. Denethor would never ever... It's like the opposite, exact opposite of Denethor. Um, he screws up, but he screws up in the opposite. He screws up in the ascetic direction, not in the, not in the luxurious direction. Um, yeah, completely wrong, uh, Sandra, I agree, is, is exactly uh, what I would use. And I'm not as offended by it because, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, it doesn't bother me as much as Faramir and Treebeard, you know, but, uh, it be, you know, but, but anyway, that's, um, yeah, Sandra, you and I are on totally the same wavelength today. Sandra is pointing, like, she keeps typing things, like, just as I'm saying them, I look down to find that Sandra has just typed it. Uh, we are totally on the same wa wavelength. See what happens, Sandra, when you get to attend one of these classes and it's not 2 o'clock in the morning? Um, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Uh, cool to be like coherent during class. It's kind of fun. Um, and <laughs> anyway, um, carrying on here. And in the second place, the Honor Stone was his by right, and nothing but expediency was against his using it. Right, We talked about that. Um, he must have guessed that the Ithil Stone was in evil hands, and risked contact with it, trusting his strength. His trust was not entirely unjustified. Sauron failed to dominate him, and could only influence him by deceits. Probably he did not at first look towards Mordor, but was content with such far views as it would afford, hence his surprising knowledge of events far off. Whether he ever thus made contact with the Orthanc Stone and Saruman is not told. Probably he did. 
Um, I find that a surprising turn of that sentence. I was, you know, reading through, I would have expected him to say, he probably didn't, but he could have. No, he probably did, and did so with profit to himself. So, like, apparently Denethor and Saruman now have been, like, pen pals for a while before this. That's fascinating. Um, Fascinating. Saruman could not break in on these conferences. Only the surveyor using the master stone of Osgiliath could eavesdrop. While two of the other stones were in response, the third would find them both blank. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is... I think we can, we can see in all of these things the, kind, the, the elements of the Lord of the Rings story that Tolkien is trying to clarify about the role of the Palantiri and how we're supposed to be thinking about it. Here we see him clarifying so much about Denethor um, and why Denethor ended up going in a different direction from Saruman. And again, it all comes back from that same thing. The fact that they're not sinister, corruptive, um, you know, you're, you're not going to get wraithified, you know, your will isn't going to be eroded directly by the Palantir, though, you know, Sauron on the other end is another story, but, um, uh, you know, these things are, uh, we can see that really all of, uh, all of these clarifications, in a sense, kind of flow out from there. Um, I have, uh, a couple other questions, um, uh, I want to touch on them because there is no other class, so I want to make sure to hit on these questions. Uh, I won't be able to take that much time with them, because I do have to go pretty soon, um, but I will touch on them first. Um, my uh, late arriving question from uh, from Alyssa here. Alyssa says, Is Faramir speaking openly of the stones to Frodo at the very end of Book 4 that is in the Two Towers, uh, in Chapter 6? Is that in any way in contradiction with the idea that the stones were a secret? Um, uh, Faramir, you may remember, says, If ever beyond hope you return to the lands of the living and we retell our tales, sitting by a wall in the sun, laughing at old grief, you shall tell me then. Until that time, or some other time, beyond the vision of the seeing stones of Numenor, farewell. Uh, uh, it says even uh, Denethor in mocking Gandalf is more circumspect in his hinting, though the stones be lost, they say. Uh, or is Faramir's expression more of an equivalent to the hobbits when the king comes back? Given that with Boromir's death he is now Denethor's heir, uh, and, the conte- uh, and in the context of the window on the west, I can't really think it's just a figure of speech. Um, but, you know, doesn't this seem like a pretty serious security breach uh, on Faramir's part? Like, he's really tipping his hand here. Um, it's like state secrets, Faramir, state secrets. This is a good question. Remember that at the beginning it says they were never, like, supposed to be secret. Oh, yeah, sorry, I haven't advanced. Oh, no, I, I haven't advanced the slide, guys, because I don't have a slide for this one. Uh, this one came in so late, it's not on a slide, so I'm just reading it to you. Um, sorry, I should have said that beforehand. Um, but anyway, um, okay, so remember at the beginning they weren't secret. They were not uh, considered secret, and then later on, they're still not secret. They're just kind of forgotten about. Denethor, doubtless, doesn't um, you know blow a trumpet about it um, because you know he's sort of preserving his own here. But um, you know, but I don't think that we necessarily have reason to believe that um, uh, that it's supposed to be a total secret. Um, I agree with you, Alyssa, that that doesn't sound to me like a when the king comes back figure of speech, exactly. Um, his reference to the um, to the stones of, 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 of the seeing stones is, I think, too explicit for that. But, um, but I do think that um, his reference is kind of fleeting enough. All it's going to do is recall the right yet yeah, oh this is clarifying from Denethor's perspective it would be a breach um, yeah you know so much so in that way Alyssa that I'm thinking sorry my uh, internet connection seems to be slowing down here which is never fun um, tell me if my audio starts getting choppy everybody because um, I know the picture is um, when uh, Sorry, let me just see if I can do something here. Really quick. Um, from Denethor's point of view, the um, the thing is so secret that I don't think 
he is even talking to Faramir about it. I doubt Faramir knows that his dad is looking in the Palantir. Um, Faramir's reference to the Palantir doubtless comes from the fact that he has had teaching, right? He's done research himself. Um, he also knows some of the lore of Gondor, and so has doubtless come across references to the Palantir. And whereas most of the people in Gondor might have forgotten about them, Faramir hasn't forgotten about them. That would kind of be like him. Um, and he might think, therefore, that it's perfectly... Uh, that there's nothing wrong with alluding to them. Um, though I doubt Denethor would totally agree um, with that concept. Um, but again, there I think that, that would just be a, a product of him not being in his father's council here. Um, anyway. Um, okay. Um, All right. One other. Uh, let me go back and do a couple other questions here. Um, these questions about some of the other um, some of the other chapters that we've been looking at um, in Unfinished Tales since we did our last bonus uh, since we did our last bonus class. Um, so uh, let me look at. Um, let's see who is next here. Sorry, I'm also trying to fix my hang-up here at the same time. I'm such a bad multitasker. Um, okay. Sorry, there we go. That should be better. I had a, a program that was not responding here, and it seemed to be locking up my, uh, my processor a bit, so I hope actually I'll be a little bit more fluid here now. Okay. Let us go back to... Quest of Erebor. I said, the quest of Erebor. Oops. All right, there we go. Yana says, <clears throat> points out, I was very troubled at that time, Gandalf said, for Saruman was hindering all my plans. This once again raises the question, why did Gandalf go to Saruman at the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring if he was already unsure about it? This doesn't seem to fit the narrative at all and only serves to make Gandalf seem inept rather than the later glorifications of Gandalf. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, this is a problem that, that, that comes up. That moment, the moment of Gandalf's voluntarily saying, hey, I'll go down and talk to Saruman because he knows better than I do and maybe he can help in this time of need. Um, that moment in the Fellowship of the Ring gets deeply undercut by all of the later stuff that Tolkien keeps writing in the Quest of Erebor about how Gandalf was already sort of annoyed with Saruman um, in the Hunt for the Ring stuff. Remember where, like, at the earlier council meeting, like, well before this, um, at the, you know, the one, like, 500 years before The Hobbit, um, you know, he was already frustrated at Saruman and was blowing the smoke rings and questioning Saruman's desires, and I think Saruman is out for the, for the, um, uh, for the for the for the rings for himself. I mean, if he already suspects, if he's been suspecting for like six hundred years that Saruman wants the rings of power for himself, you'd think he might, you know, take a deep breath and count to a hundred before he went galloping off to uh, to Isengard. There is no question that that makes it difficult. So the more that Gandalf's knowledge increases, the more that his um, uh, the more that his wisdom. Um, outside of that moment uh, is raised by Tolkien, the more questionable that moment becomes. Um, and I, so Yana, I think that that's, that's simply an inconsistency. And Yana, you are absolutely right that it's much worse in the movie. Um, the, the sort of... Gandalf in the movie is just adorable in the faith that he has in Saruman. He's like, gosh, Frodo, I don't know what to do. But I know I'm going to go ask Saruman because he is very wise. He will know what to do. Right? So I'm going to leave you all by yourself and just gallop off in the other direction because the ring wraiths are coming. So I want to make sure I leave you alone, and I'm, but, but I'm going to go seek help. Again, it's just so precious the way that Gandalf has that kind of faith. Um, and that, now, Noam, I agree with you. In 600 years, Saruman hasn't done anything openly wrong. Clearly agree. Had they known he's breeding orcs or something in Isengard, uh, it, would have been, it would have been completely you know, unconscionable and inconceivable that Gandalf would have, would have done this. There's no question. Um, I'm not saying that, based on everything we've been told, um, 
Gandalf should have been 100% convinced that Saruman had turned to evil. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, if he was as suspicious of Saruman as he was, as we've been led to believe from all of these other things, um, it is hard to imagine him getting suckered into going to Orthanc. The only thing we have left to sort of stand on for why Gandalf would do that is the instrument, uh, is the, 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 the use of Radagast. The fact that Radagast has persuaded him. Um, that he trusts it because it's... But again, even there, like, it's hard to imagine the Gandalf of the Quest of Erebor, or the Gandalf of the Hunt for the Ring, um, it's hard to... Or the Gandalf of the, the later Istari writings, it's hard to imagine that Gandalf even getting, even getting the wool pulled over his eyes by Radagast, you know, uh, without... Um, um, not in purpose. Um, and Sandra, you're absolutely right. Um, I... You're absolutely right that just as the film version of Gandalf's lack of distrust in Saruman makes that situation more extreme, so too the problem of consistency is made even more pointed by Gandalf's treatment in the Hobbit films. Um, that he is clearly distrustful of Saruman. The kind of... Um, the kind of uh, 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 puppy dog loyalty that he shows to Saruman uh, in Bag End in the beginning of film one is completely out of keeping with how they've depicted Gandalf and his reaction, his rolling of his eyes and everything in in in, uh, in Hobbit film one. Um, anyway, but um, uh, yeah, good. Um, okay. So anyway, so Yana, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer to this question. I think that this is, this is, this is, this is an inconsistency. This is a, this is a moment. It's an element of the story, which predates all of this development of Gandalf's character, and but one of the consequences of the growth of Gandalf's character, both over the course of the Lord of the Rings, but more importantly in Tolkien's Afterthought, is that this passage becomes harder and harder to justify. Um, in consequence, I, just, I think that's an issue. Uh, Ed had a Druidine question. This is in particular in response to my comments about the apparent plasticity of the human race uh, and how they develop in different ways and get uh, short and all that kind of thing. Both in the cases of elves and men, Ed points out, it was said that they awakened in Quivienen and Hildorian, respectively. In the case of the elves, it's fairly clear that there were a large number of elves who awakened under the stars. I see no reason to believe that this was not the case with men either. Many men and women could have awakened in Hildorian, some tall, some short, some dark, some light. The elves sorted themselves into tribes, only three of which went on the great journey. Why would not elves sort themselves based on physical appearance? We deride this today as racism, but go into any high school lunchroom in America and you see kids sorting themselves according to appearance even today. There is no reason to believe that there weren't a large number of men of all sorts awakening together and that they sorted themselves all ac- and then that they sorted themselves accordingly. Not that there was a single Adam and Eve from whom all men, Edine and Druidine alike, are descended. I agree. There's, we are not given any clear reason to think that a bunch of men did not wake uh, in Hildorian, and it is quite possible. Maybe from the beginning, maybe there was, like, you know, Adam and Eve Droog, uh, who awoke by Hildorian with the, uh, you know, the, the four parents of the other uh, race, races of men. That's entirely possible. But, um, uh, the one thing I would say is Tolkien does say very clearly, I think, that hobbits change size over like appreciable historical periods. In particular, he talks about um, he talks about the um, further diminishment of hobbits. Um, in concerning hobbits at the beginning, he says that since the time of the Lord of the Rings, hobbits have have have, have diminished even more. They're even shorter now than they were back then. And I think that 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 is one of the things that primarily leads me to believe that the that there's the clear the the indica- as well as the diminishing of the Numenorians. This is a thing that happens. I mean, the the alteration of the size of men over time um, happens. So it seems to have happened more dramatically with hobbits. Um, did it happen with the Druidine as well? I don't know. I mean, we just we just don't know that for sure. Um, so although I do agree with you that we, 
the way that Tolkien describes this does not compel us to imagine Iluvatar creating a you know a solitary Adam and Eve from whom all races of humans are descended, um, you know Numenorians and Hobbits and Drugs alike, um, but. Um, but yet, it, it is, I think, necess- uh, nevertheless clear that there is that kind of macroscopic change in stature um, over comparatively short historical periods. Um, and uh, I was kind of teasing Ed in my subtitle of this. Ed goes on in the rest of his email to uh, suggest that he doesn't think, uh, he also doesn't think there's evidence to believe that Tolkien is a Darwinian so that we shouldn't be thinking in Darwinian terms when we're thinking of the change of the race over time. And I agree with you, Ed. I don't think that we have any reason to think he's a Darwinian either. Um, but uh, anyway, I didn't quote that, the, the, the rest of the email. But, but certainly, I agree with Ed that we, we shouldn't assume that. Okay, last one. Uh, An Astari question. Question slash observation from April. I loved the way Unfinished Tales described Gandalf as opposing the fire that devours and wastes with the fire that kindles. In The Two Towers, Gandalf, recently upgraded, discusses the fall of Boromir with Aragorn on the edge of Fangorn. Aragorn accuses him of speaking in riddles. What, in riddles? said Gandalf. No, for I was talking aloud to myself. He laughed, but the sound now seemed warm and kindly as a gleam of sunshine. Later, Gandalf describes his ride with Gwaihir, in which Gwaihir states, A burden you have been, but not so now. Light as a swan's feather in my claw you are, the sun shines through you. I never really thought about what kind of spirit or Maiar Gandalf was, not in terms of elemental nature. After reading the Astari, it seems to me that Gandalf's main elemental being would be of sunlight, which can banish shadows. As the Unfinished Tale says, the fire that kindles and warms. This is a very fitting. This is very fitting as well with the time Gandalf spent with Nienna and the, emphasis, the empathy he displays throughout the books. Also, his being some sort of fire elemental would account for his fiery temper. Um, uh, First of all, I love April your observations. The 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 connections with sunshine. There's certainly, especially post Gandalf, a uh, post resurrection Gandalf, uh, is frequently, um, so you know the 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 bright and shining light um, that he is. I think that that's a that's a that's a really good pickup there um, in seeing him, not just associated with light, not to be thinking of Gandalf as a kind of. I mean, we know that his light is white, right? So it might be kind of easy for us to imagine a kind of a sterile white light, like fluorescent light or something like that. Um, but he's like he is warm and kindly, like sunshine, right? Um, that's the light that he's associated with. And remember, sunshine itself is associated with fire. Arya, the spirit of fire, is the one who's up in the sun with the final fruit of Laurelin. So. Um, uh, so there's another reason to associate sunlight with fire, but again, it, I, 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 do, I, I also like that April, that sort of association. Now, Oloran and who Oloran was, you know, we're, we're told we're given a background for him um, in, uh, uh, in a sort of a brief history of him in the uh, in the um, Valaquenta at the beginning of the Silmarillion, um, and you know, th- I think the main thing that's to me interesting about Gandalf is the number of different people that he's associated with that is different val I mean he's he's he is associated with fire he does seem to be in some sense he does ha- does seem to have a special affinity with fire i totally agree um with that but um uh but he um he also through his name, you know, and the whole dreams thing, he seems associated with Lorien as well. Um, he took up with Nienna, you know, and learned from her. He's associated. He's associated with um, with pity, um, the kind of pity that, uh, that Nienna shows to people. Um, in the end, I think one of the things we see in Gandalf, rather than um, sort of trying to peg him exactly, because he's not in that way, precisely peggable, um, is instead we see somebody who, through his own humility, has learned lessons from everybody, right? Has really taken in, um, you know, he's he is like Lorian, and he's like Nienna, and he's like Manway, and he's like, um, uh, you know, he is, he is, he is like Aryan, he's like a spirit of fire, um, 
uh, he is not only Saruman as he might have been, um, you know, April, you could go further and, you know, remember he's fighting against a Balrog. That's like fire against fire, right? Um, the Balrogs are spirits of fire, corrupted spirits of fire. Gandalf is like an uncorrupted spirit of fire, and that confrontation on that level is lovely. Um, Faye, that's a wonderful observation. Faye says, Gandalf is truly the white, uh, uh, and thus, you know, in some ways, the one of many colors, right? Yeah, what Saruman tried to do was a mere mockery, right? In his arrogance, he wanted to be Saruman of many colors. Gandalf really is, through his humility, Gandalf of many colors. Um, and because he, you know, he is, uh, uh, through his hum- humility, learned the lessons from all of these people, and so therefore uh, can embody all of these things. I think that's a really neat way of thinking about it. Um, good. Um, well, I have to go, as always, when I do my Europe-friendly times, uh, I can hear the disturbance through the ceiling up there, uh, my children running around uh, needing to be fed dinner, so I have to go feed my children, uh, lest they start to forage for themselves, which could always be dangerous. Uh, but thank you very much for um, uh, for joining me in this class. Um, we've now completed uh, two, uh, one pilot plus two official Mythgard Academy classes. These have been awesome fun. Um, I've enjoyed each one more than the last. Um, we are looking for, just a reminder, we are looking forward to beginning our first non-Tolkien class. We're going to be studying Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. We're going to be beginning, be beginning that in the first week of April. Look for announcements on that. I hope to have the web page and schedule uh, for that posted by the end of this week. Um, but again, that's going to start soon, and soon thereafter we'll begin the election for the because that's going to be a short class. So the election for the the book after that will be firing up pretty quickly. So if you have opinions on uh, what you would like us to read and talk about after we do Ender's Game, uh, there's still time to get involved uh, in that, as I've explained uh, at different times before. So. Um, uh, so I, I, I encourage you to do that. A couple of you have been mentioning. Yeah, Yana was just now mentioning we should do the history of Middle Earth. I'm game. You know, if you guys want to, uh, you know, those of you who are nominators and electors want to start a campaign to, uh, you know, go back and do the Book of Lost Tales and march our way through the history of Middle Earth series. I am, I am, I am at your mercy. I will, I, we will do whatever you want to do. So uh, I think that would be fun. So. Um, we are going to be alternating with non-Tolkien book stuff. We are going to sort of mix things up. We don't want to get um, totally immersed in one thing because there are lots of different interests among the people who are uh, who are nominating and voting here. So we don't want to... It's not going to be just a Tolkien series. Um, but yeah, it's certainly something that we could do uh, and would be a lot of fun. So... Um, yeah, Okay. Well, very good. I had thanks. I always, I always have a hard time saying goodbye at the end of the last class, but of course, it's not really goodbye, and it's not really the last class. But thank you for the, en- you know, from the end of the unfinished towers session, and I look forward to starting Ender's Game with you in a couple weeks. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.